program is a paid presentation. Wake up to the Word. Share an uplifting hour with grace and glory and Baltimore's faithful. Well, good morning and welcome once again to Baltimore's number one gospel program, Grace and Glory, on this uh, somewhat somber Sunday, but yet we still take time to celebrate uh, God's goodness in spite of, of course, 911 is no uh, secret to all of us. It, it changed uh, uh, the way we looked at everything in this country after the events happened a few years ago. And we uh, reflect and uh, lift up prayers for families that are still trying to recover from the losses uh, that happened that day. Now, for today, uh, we've got the spoken word for you. We also have First Lady Lenyard Robinson who will be joining us with her very special segment. So let's make our way hastily to that uh, segment with First Lady Robinson after first making a stop at Southern Baptist Church and Bishop Dante Hickman right here on Grace and Glory. Welcome to the television broadcast ministry of Southern Baptist Church. And now a word from our pastor, Dr. Dante L. Hickman Sr. By the time of our text, the king of, of Jerusalem had heard about Joshua and the people of God and how they had defeated the armies of Ai and how they had overtaken the city of Jericho. And this particular king over Jerusalem at that time became even more concerned when the Gibeonites made peace with Joshua and the children of Israel. Gibeon, he figured, was a great city, and why did they go and make peace instead of war with the children of Israel? So the king of Jerusalem called four other kings that represented Hebron and Lachish, Eglon and Jarmuth, and they said to them that we need to go and conquer the Gibeonites for making peace with the children of Israel. But while they were coming, the Gibeonites called on Joshua to come and help them to fight against the five kings and their overwhelming armies. And as Joshua was making his way to the battle, God spoke to him while he was on his way and confirmed that he would be with him and that he would have the victory. That had to have been good news for Joshua. It must be wonderful to know that you can go into a battle with confidence when you have confirmation from God that you're going to come out and that you're going to come out victorious. But all of this, my dear brothers and sisters, could have been avoided if the king of Jerusalem and the other five kings, or the four kings, had decided not to attack the Gibeonites. They really teach us that there's so many battles that we can avoid and so many losses that we can prevent if we would just come to the right conclusions and determinations. You ain't got to fight everybody. We know you bad and we know you come from the hood, but you ain't got to put up your dukes all the time. You ain't got to always be looking for a battle. Sometimes you ought to be looking for peace. And we ought not attack every adversary who has not attacked us. Everybody does not have to agree with us. Everybody doesn't have to be in perfect alignment with us in order for us to exist in the same space and in the same place. Nevertheless, these five kings attack Gibeon because of their assumptions. Let the church say assumptions. They assume that because Joshua and the children of Israel had overtaken Jericho, defeated Ai, and made peace with Gibeon, that their territories would be taken next. They made a decision to fight based on their fear rather than the facts. And all of us need to take a lesson and learn that we should never make a decision out of fear over facts. History has taught us and our experiences have taught us that when we allow our fears to override the facts, we engage in wars where there are no weapons of mass destruction. When we allow our fears to override the facts, we give in to the myths and the prejudices about race, and all of a sudden we believe that white is right and black is bad. When we allow our fears to override the facts, we accept that the national deficit is too high to house the homeless, to educate every child, to rebuild our communities, 
and to end economic disparities. But the deficit is low enough to build the prison industry, to send billions to Ukraine, something must be over in Ukraine, and spend trillions on wars overseas. All I'm trying to tell us is that before you get in a fight you can't win, get the facts. Before you think somebody doesn't like you based on how you think they looked at you, get the facts. Before you judge someone based on what they look like on the outside, get the facts. And before you bet on who's gonna win the Super Bowl this evening, get the facts. These, these, these kings attack Gibeon because of their assumptions, but not only because of their assumptions, because of their arrogance. Let the church say arrogance. They failed to emulate the example of Gibeon by making peace. They knew about the peace treaty that the Gibeonites had made, yet they felt that they were in a position where they didn't have to compromise. They, they, they had gotten so strong and they had been where they were so long that they thought they didn't have to compromise with anybody. But I don't care how formidable and how comfortable you have become with who you are and what you have, never forget that it all belongs to God. Now, everything you have belongs to God. I don't, I don't care how you worked for it through your blood, sweat, and tears. I don't care how many mornings you got up to go to that job. Everything that you've attained, everything you've achieved, everything you've accomplished, it belongs to God. And the moment in which you don't give God glory for what God has done for you, God knows how to take it from you and give it to somebody else who knows what to do with it. Have I got a witness here? You see, my dear brothers and sisters, the whole narrative of the Old Testament conquest of the people of God anyway was not about an angry God who decided to get his own people to go and destroy people who were unwitting and unknowing. No, it's about a God who created everything, but the occupants of what he created decided that he was not going to be their God. They disrespected him. They rejected him, they ejected him, and then they made gods out of the things he created against him. And God said, no, it ain't going down like that. He said, instead of wiping the whole world out for a few, I'll create somebody's out of nobody. I'll take them through a wilderness process. And then in the right time, I'll use those same people to overcome everybody that tried to overwhelm them. And, and the mistake, my dear brothers and sisters, that these particular kings made was in their determination to attack the Gibeonites for making peace instead of war. Now, now you ought to know that you'll never get anywhere fighting somebody who really ain't trying to fight. They attack the Gibeonites instead of the Israelites. Have you ever wondered why some people want to pick on people who ain't going to try to fight them, but when it comes to somebody tough, they don't pick on them? Oh, they ain't, want no, they ain't want no stuff with the Israelites. They thought that the Gibeonites were weak and without help. And they thought that because they had the majority that they would prevail. But somebody here is a witness that our God specializes in overwhelming the majority. Our God is a God that can take one and put 1,000 to flight. And he can take two and put 10,000 to flight. And I don't need all of y'all to shout, but if I get two or three of you that can touch and agree in the name of Jesus, the Lord will show up and run a hundred devils out of the church. Have I got a witness here? All I'm trying to tell you is that if God be for you, he is more than the world against you. It doesn't matter who doesn't like you. It doesn't matter who's trying to come against you. It doesn't matter how strong or educated or how much money they have. You can be a little old nobody from nowhere and God will still keep you, protect you. And before you know it, you'll look around and you'll still be alive and they'll be dead and gone. Preach, Dante. They, they attack. They attack the Gibeonites because of their assumptions. 
They attack the Gibeonites because of their arrogance. And then they attack the, the Gibeonites because of their acquiescence. Let the church say acquiescence. Yeah, if that was your first time saying it, you just spoke in tongues. When the king of Jerusalem heard about Joshua's conquest, he conspired and pulled four other kings into his fight. He was so insecure and so inferior that he projected his own fears on the other people who were just minding their own business. And I'm trying to tell you, you got to be careful, super careful about allowing other people to pull you into their battles. Some of y'all right now don't like somebody because your girlfriend don't like somebody and you don't even know that somebody that they don't like. You don't even know why you don't like them. Let me give you a, a study of Negroology 101. The person you don't like because your girlfriend don't like them will be the person that will end up being your girlfriend's best friend and both of them won't like you. Preach Dante. All I'm trying to tell you is you've got to get to know people for yourself before you believe everything somebody else said about them. Too many of us are in a mess because we let somebody else drag us into their mess. Too many of our young boys are locked up in jail because they allowed their friends to drag them into beefs that didn't have nothing to do with them. Too many of them are dead and sleeping in their grave because they hung out with people that thought that the neighborhood belonged to them and they don't even pay taxes. How you gonna claim the neighborhood and you don't pay the water bill, you don't pay the tax bill, you don't pay the property insurance, you don't pay a rent or a mortgage? Negro, please! All I'm trying to tell you is you got to pick your battles beyond your friends. And if you got some friends that all they do is stay in a mess, all they do is stay in a beef, all they do is stay in a fight, you need to find you. Thank you. Subsequently, subsequently, the kings got themselves in a battle that they could not win. And whenever you decide to go against God's people, you will be fighting a losing battle. Because the Bible says, touch not my anointed. Do my prophets and my servants no harm. Not just the preachers, but the people in the pew. Keep your mouth off of God's preachers. And keep your mouth off of God's people. Yeah, they might be imperfect. Yeah, they might not do everything right. But when you start trying to fight who God has his hands on, you ain't going to do nothing but curse your own life and then die. Jesus said it would be better if a millstone would be tied around your neck and you drowned in the sea than to mess with one of my little children. It doesn't matter how many people you have on your side if God is not on your side. And the Bible says, and I'm almost done, that Joshua led the people in the battle. And surprisingly that day, they were slaughtering most of the armies of the five kings. And they put them on the run. And while they were running, God caused a hailstorm to kill more people than Joshua did, that did by his hand and his sword. And as the day was about to become night, Joshua prayed that the sun and the moon would stand still to give him enough daylight to finish the fight. Now some scholars say his language was that the sun and the moon ceased from acting so that the earth could uh, prevent the night from coming on. And then other folks say he just didn't understand earth science because the sun don't move and, and neither does the moon. And some of y'all just learned that for the first time. Don't tell nobody. But that the earth moved on its axis. Nevertheless, I don't care whether he was smart or ignorant. What I do know is he prayed a big prayer to a big God who essentially granted his requests. And I stopped by to tell you, you may not know all the words of prayer. 
and you may not know the specificity of your prayer, but I dare you to tap somebody and tell them God knows what you mean, and God knows what you need. Because when I read this text, God caused the earth to be still, and God caused time to stop, and God caused daylight savings time to take effect. So to teach us that we should never be afraid to ask God for something big, ask God for something supernatural, ask God for something humanly impossible. And I know I got about 20 witnesses in the house that can testify I asked God for some stuff that I could not do for myself and God worked it out. Somebody can testify he healed my body. He moved some mountains. He paid some bills. He opened some doors. He made some ways. He made my enemy my footstool. And what I thought I could not make it out, I still made it out all right. I came to tell you it is no secret what God can do. If God brought me out, he can bring you out too. Can I preach like I feel it? But what was interesting to me the most was not that God could stop the night because God can do anything but fail, but that Joshua wanted to finish this fight. And I'm preaching this sermon for those of us who procrastinate about everything and we find ourselves fighting the same battles that we should have won by now. Look at you, it's February of 2020. You started the year off resolved to overcome obesity, to overcome poor health, bad relationships, low ambition, lack of discipline, addictive behaviors, and financial ruin. But it seems like you've been ambushed by the devil. And like five kings, five things have surrounded you at the same time. And you're saying, I'm running out of time. I should have got my degrees in my 20s. I should have got married by the time I was 30. I should have had children before 40 came along. And now I'm running out of time. But I got good news for you this afternoon. And you better shout when I tell you this. But God told me to tell you, he's about to give you some extra time. Somebody help me preach in the house. Shake somebody's hand and tell them God is about to give you some extra time. He's going to give you back the years that the canker worm have eaten. You missed some opportunities. Some things didn't come to pass. And you made up your mind to just quit and live with life the way that it is. But I dare you to shake somebody's hand and tell them you got extra time to finish this fight. Can I preach like I feel it? God said finish the fight to prevent your enemies from regrouping on you. See, some of y'all should be dead and some of y'all should be crazy because your enemies will try to come back and get revenge. That's what the Bible says, that while the king's men were being killed, the kings were hiding in a cave that would eventually be their grave. That's why you gotta be careful fighting battles for people that won't fight for themselves. Look at somebody and tell them, fight some of your own battles. I'll pray for you, but you gotta fight this one yourself. I'll pray for you, but you gotta find a job and pay your own bills, cause I got my own bills to pay. I wish I had a witness here. Nevertheless, Joshua, he did not settle for putting the enemy on the run because he knew if he didn't kill this devil, then this devil would come back stronger. And sometimes, brothers and sisters, you got to block some folk. You got to delete some folk. And you got to totally defeat anything and anybody that tried to kill you the first time. Because my grandmother said, if they show you who they are, 
then you got to believe what they have shown you. And I might forgive you, but I'll never forget what was in you that tried to kill me in the first place. Can I preach like I feel it? If they did not give you the respect of a conversation before attempting annihilation, you don't owe them nothing. Shake somebody's hand and tell them shut it down while you still have the power to shut it down. I feel the Holy Ghost trying to get in this room. Somebody can testify. Satan did have me. He had me before I found Jesus. He had me when I was doing everything I was big and bad enough to do. But I need 20 folk to high five me and say he should have killed me when he had the chance. But it's too late now. I done found Jesus. I didn't learn how to trust in God. I have learned how to depend on his word. Can I preach like I feel it? Shake somebody's hand like you're going to shake it off. Tell them whatever you do, finish this fight so you can prevent your enemies from regrouping. Finish this fight to preserve your energy for the battles that remain. Turn me loose here. I'm trying to preach, but tell your neighbor, you got too many battles. You got too many blessings. You got too many breakthroughs. You got too many benefits coming in March, April, May for you to get stuck on last January, on last March, and on last September. Somebody help me preach. Joshua said, Dante, I got more battles to fight, so I can't get ready to fight a scheduled battle if I'm preoccupied with the last battle that God already delivered me from and gave me victory over. I feel the Holy Ghost tell somebody you can't take today into tomorrow. Y'all ain't helping me preach. I said you can't take today into tomorrow. Fight that devil today so you can go to sleep tonight and wake up and beat another devil tomorrow. Have I got a witness? We think may endure for a night, but joy will come in the morning. Shake yourself and say, I'm getting over this. I'm going to defeat this today. I'm going to defeat this before I leave church. Because you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to put it in the hands of the Lord. Somebody shout, it's above me now. My pain is above me now. My haters is above me now. My problems is above me now. My stress, my depression, my fears, my anxiety, my worry about tomorrow is in God's hand. Somebody shout, it's over now. It stops now. The devil is defeated. Somebody shout. Somebody praise him. Like you know that you know that you know that you know it's over and the best is yet to come. Good afternoon. May the Lord bless all of y'all real, real good. But I came to tell you, finish this fight. Grab three people. Tell them finish this fight, leave nobody untouched. Don't stand there, but grab somebody. Tell them whatever you do, finish this fight so you can praise your God and enjoy your rest. Yeah, remember that Israel did not come to start a fight, but they came to help somebody else who was in a fight. But when the battle was over, they went back to Gilgal. Somebody shout Gilgal. Gilgal was their place of sanctuary. Gilgal was their place of rest. And every now and then, every now and then, 
got to pause to thank God for the battles he helped you to win. Y'all excuse me, but I didn't come to church to fight. I didn't come to church to play games. I came to church because when I think of the goodness of Jesus and everything he has done and kept me from, I came to praise him. I came to celebrate. I came to lift my hands. I came to shout hallelujah. I came to do my dance. Is there anybody here that knows God's been good to you? God's made ways for you. God woke you up. God put food on the table. Lift up your hands. Throw back your head and shout finish this fight finish this fight like Jesus on an old rugged cross he died didn't he die but early early Sunday morning he got up with all power in his hand don't go to bed till you kill the devil don't go to bed with stress in your head. Finish! Look at somebody and tell them, I refuse to keep certain people on my mind overnight. Come on, come on, look at somebody and tell them, you might go to work with me, but you ain't going home with me. You ain't going to bed with me, and you ain't going to church with me. This is the day that the Lord has finished that fight. Real quick, real quick. I want you to grab somebody right quick. And when you grab them, I want them to pull away. Come on, grab somebody and pull away. Grab somebody else and pull away. And tell your neighbor, can't nothing make me hold on to somebody that can't hold on to me. You can't hold this. You can't hold this. You can't hold this. You can't hold me back. You can't hold me from my favor. You can't keep me from my future. The devil is a liar. You've been watching the television broadcast of Southern Baptist Church, where Dr. Dante L. Hickman Sr. is the pastor. If you desire to purchase a copy of this week's broadcast or any of our other media treasures, please call our media ministry at 410-732-8566. God is so good. God is so amazing. And God is so faithful. And I'm so excited that you are joining us this morning for the women's segment of Grace and Glory. As you know, I am Pastor Lady Linyar Robinson of Dream Life Worship Center right here in Randallstown. And I, as always, am, am, I am so blessed to be beginning my Sunday morning with you. And today I am again, from time to time, I feature new authors. And today I am featuring a new author and I'm so excited for her to be with us, to share her story. All right, she's been with us before. And good morning and welcome, morning. Danielle Giddens. Good morning, thank you for having me, Lady. I'm so glad to have you. For those of you all who are viewing, um, I've had Danielle has been our guest before. Um, not only, not only Danielle, are you uh, an amazing 
hairstylist. My hairstylist also, but uh, a, a longtime entrepreneur, an amazing woman of God, a wife, a mother, uh, a student, a lifetime student, a lifetime learner. I've noticed that about you, but now you are an author. Yes. And I think that's amazing. So I congratulate you. Thank you. Thank you. So, to share it. with us, uh, Danielle, how long have you always wanted to be an author? No, not at all. It was never on my radar. Wow. <laughs> no, I only wanted to become an author when I realized that um, my daughters, I journal a lot. Oh. And so I had 26 journals. Wow. And I went to go put those journals on a bookshelf in a room mm -hmm. that I was redoing. Mm -hmm. And um, I read through a couple of them. And mm -hmm. I realized that my oldest daughter, her life was mimicking my life. Wow. And it That's frightened right. me because yeah. I never wanted to influence my daughters in that way. Right. So it made me want to be able to, I threw the journals away. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. it made me want to be able to write them and give it to them my story as a redeemed woman in Christ. Oh, wow. And, um, with wisdom, as opposed yeah. to us sharing the story from the same perspective. So that's why I wrote the book. So your motivation was was sort of uh, coming to, you know, coming full circle when you saw your journaling and you saw your story. You know, you heard that, ladies. You heard that, that you could be, you could be writing a book. You're journaling. Mm -hmm. Yes. could be becoming your your testament your testimony yes. your living epistle i love that you say you really wanted to control the narrative yes. of how how you left your testimony yes. share with our viewing audience danielle a little bit about give us a, a give us a little peek into what the book is about so i wrote my first book and it's mm -hmm. called from poverty in prison to purpose a journey mm -hmm. of discovering freedom how? Um, that is about my life from a young girl growing up in the projects, McCullough Homes in Baltimore, Maryland. Mm -hmm. And I grew up there from, from, from birth to the age of 18, mm -hmm. all of the things that I went through, the traumas that I experienced as a child, um, me having parents that were drug addicted, mm -hmm. uh, you know, me going through molestation mm -hmm. and, me not having a father around and how it shaped my influences and how I became um, addicted to a life of not understanding and knowing who yeah. I was as a person. And so wow. that took me on a journey of allowing myself to get into different situations to mm -hmm. af afford things that I wasn't able to afford mm -hmm. in my poverty stricken state. Mm. And so that's where prison came into play. And wow. then with um, me being into prison, how, you know, my cellmate wound up being a woman who gave me the Bible to read. Wow. And so just, you know, God <laughs> being in all of those places and, and that woman saying, hey, I'm going to give you this while you're in this valley place and so Absolutely. You know, just being able to walk in my purpose leaving mm -hmm. and just feeling redeemed as a woman now you know for me to be able to share my story with other young girls so that they won't make the same mistakes that i've made through life um when you experience these traumas and yeah life, they're 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 more common than we we you know tend yeah. to that's powerful, Danielle. I heard you say the word redeemed several times, yes. and I can't help but be reminded of the scripture, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. And I would I would agree that you are saying so in, in the writing of your book. You are, you are telling your story and letting your light shine. And uh, it's one thing to share your story with your daughters, those to close around you, but to tell the world about it, yes. to tell the world about it. That is really something very powerful that I think that all of our ladies who are listening today uh, can and can sort of consider, yes. you know, how powerful our voice is. Yes. Do you, do, you, do you feel a sense of empowerment, a more empowerment after you have shared your story in book form? 
I do. Um, I will say that um, this book took me three years to write. Mm -hmm. In those three years, there were times where it was just me and God, and I was actually healing through some of the things that mm -hmm. I had spoke about for the first time mm -hmm. when I was writing those pages. And so it was a journey of me going back and 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 opening up those things that I locked and healing through yeah. them. And so I do feel like that this was a journey that God has taken me through and that when I felt his presence, when I would sit yeah. there and be like, God, help me through this. You know, mm -hmm. I always felt as though, you know, that I was empowered because I felt like God walked me through this because I was still like, oh my gosh, you want me to tell them this? Right, right. Was, I was trying to keep some stuff to myself, but yeah. the Lord was like, no, I need you to put it in. But the Bible was in telling it. It was in telling. They overcame the, the wicked one, the scripture says, yeah. by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. Well, Danielle, let our viewers know, please, how they can stay connected to you. And I thank you so much for taking your time out to share oh, with us today. You. But let everybody know how they can connect with you, how they can, you know, so that they can get the book, so they can follow you, so they can get connected and get inspired. Amen. And so they can do what God called them to do as well. Thank God for you. Let them know how to get, get connected to you. So you can find me on Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, and YouTube as Danielle C. Giddens. That they are all of my handles um, for social media. My book is on Amazon. Let us see it again. Yes, this is my little baby. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this is my book cover. It's on Amazon. You can find it at, um, or you can find it on my website, which is www.daniellecgiddens.com. Thank you so much, Danielle. You so I cannot much. wait to you see too. where this is going to take you That's and how most of all, how many lives is going to bless. Thank yes. you so much for joining us today. Good morning and welcome to the Catalyst for Life televised broadcast brought to you by the Word of Life Christian Community Church, where the pastors are Dr. Jermaine Johnson and co-pastor Elder Michelle Johnson, where we believe that it all begins with the word for the word is life. Somebody thank God. As we begin this sermon series, Getting My Life Back, I want to preach for the first installment, Never Settle. Somebody say, Never Settle. Before you go to your seats, look at your name and say, Good morning. So I'm in process of getting my life back. I have a word to never settle. Come on and put your hands together and give God praise. Never settle. Settle. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Never, never settle. Author Greg Holder writes in his post-pandemic book entitled Never Settle that no one chooses a less than life. Holder suggests little by little we start putting down roots in a land that is less than satisfying and before we know it our faith is apathetic bland and lukewarm the premise of holder's book in this post-pandemic world is for the reader to acknowledge that there is a better way that there's a better way to live in your moment there's a better way to live courageously that there's a better way to take one day, one step, one faithful act at a time. Holders determined through this book for the reader to make it out of his or her season of stagnation. Holder uses the word lukewarmness. Don't try to look it up. All he did was play on the word lukewarm. The word lukewarm, lukewarmness implies a certain kind of life that we are no longer to live. I want to announce to you today that your days of half-hearted existence are over and they are behind you. Living and feeling less than is under your feet because the covenant that you have with Jesus Holder says that every choice in your day 
is crackling with God's redemptive power due to the fact that following the steps of Jesus will lead us to bold expressions of love by our words, our ways, and the witness of Christ. For Jesus declares that he is the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father except by him. And in this day, we need bold expressions of love. We need bold executions of life. We need bold exercises that life is worth living. We need bold exercises to demonstrate to all generations that, that, that we are a community and we don't have to settle everything by picking up a gun and going to a school and, and messing up life for everybody. We, we, we don't have to have bold. We have to demonstrate uh, the greater good of humanity that we set policies and, and administrations for the greater good of humanity, not just uh, our own self-interest, uh, but for the interests of others. Y'all, we have to have bold expressions of life and love as we inspire communities, as we influence nations, as we impact countries. We need the disciples of Christ, y'all, that means you, uh, to come in in compliance uh, with his word and his ways uh, and allow the impact uh, of God's words and ways uh, to be a witness uh, and just as it changed your life, uh, watch uh, the body of Christ uh, turn the world upside down. Do I have a witness uh, in this house that realizes, that can testify that since Jesus uh, came into my life, uh, my life has never been the same. The things that I, I used to cry about, now I can laugh about. The things that were a sense of discouragement, now some kind of way, God uses those things for my destiny. It's in Matthew 6.33 where Jesus says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God. And his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. We will settle. We will no longer settle for less, but we will choose God's more glorious way. Somebody say, I ain't settling for less. I'm going to choose God's more glorious way. It may take longer. It may be more painful, but I've learned with God that it will be eternal. It will be sustainable. It will give me peace in the midst of the storm. Somebody say God's way is the best way. Look at your name and say God's way is the only way. And I'm choosing God's more glorious way. And holders suggest that if we make our choices and our chain reactions, that it will give us the strength that we can stand and declare I'm never settling. Somebody say I'm not selling for less. God has more for me. I want God's best. Can you encourage yourself and say, I deserve because I'm in covenant with God. I deserve his best. That's not a sense of entitlement. That's because I know who my father is and I know who I'm connected to. I deserve God's best is on schedule for me. And a holder suggests that the way out is in our ability to keep moving forward. Good God Almighty. Somebody declare the way out is for us to keep moving forward. That, that our choices and our chain reactions it implies that we're moving. That I'm a moving target. Even though, though I don't feel like moving. Even though I'm fighting the, the, the spiritual warfare. I'm fighting the desires of my flesh. I'm fighting myself some kind of way. I'm still moving moving in my mind. I'm moving in my physicality because now is not the time to put down roots in the safe and the predictable. But in this ninth month, in this year of restoration, the first step for all of us is to refuse to settle for less because greater is on the horizon. If you don't know it, you are pandemic 
proof. You made it through a virus that killed millions and look at you still in your right mind. How you knew life was turned upside down. Your church, your job, your money, the way you went about life. But look at you. You made it out of that storm. Come on. What drove many crazy? You here with a praise on your lips. You here with thanksgiving in your heart. Somebody say you post pandemic proof. I don't know what you went through in your childhood. I don't know what you went through in your marriage. I don't know what you went through in your school. But I'm trying to tell you you're post storm. You've come out of some stuff that have drove others crazy. But here you are aligned and ready for what God has for you in the next season of your life. I want somebody to take a quick flashback over the last 24 months. No, scratch that. Take a flashback over the last 12 months. No, scratch that. Take a flashback over the last 8 months. No, flash that. Can you thank God for what he's done over the last 8 hours? How he's kept your mind in spite of all that life has thrown at you. Somebody say, I'm getting my life back because greater is on. Greater is on the horizon. As we arrive on the scene of our text, we, we have entered the gospel of the greater. Whenever we see the gospel of John, we know that greater is on the horizon. John's gospel is a gospel that is written some uh, 35, 40 years after synoptic gospel. Synoptic gospels are called Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Pastor Michelle mentioned this earlier. Many of their gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they focused on a Greek word called dunamis, which means dynamite, which talks about the explosive power of God. They told the genealogy of Christ. They talked about the history of Jesus. They, they talked about various aspects of the person and work of Jesus. But when we get to the gospel of John, John writes his gospel some 35 years later. And the fact that Matthew and Mark covered some things, John wanted to tell you that there is more, that you don't have to settle for this, but there is so much more that I can tell you about Jesus. I, I know what you read in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and there have been some wonderful stories stories about the woman being healed with the issue of blood. That was a great story about Jairus's daughter being healed. Y'all, that was a great story. It was a great story of how Jesus came through 40 and two generations and all of that expressed the power of Christ. But by the time we get to John's gospel, he uses a word called Simeon called signs that points you and I to the greater. He's letting you know that the power in your life, the power of Christ has been established. Now I'm going to instruct you and direct you how to maximize that power for the greater in your life. So he uses a sign and every sign that Jesus performs in the gospel of John, it points you and I to the greater. Good God. God Almighty. Can I tell you that if you miss something, you got the power. You've seen the power of how he can snatch you out of death into life. You've experienced the power of Christ, of how he took you out of depression, and you are sitting here with the peace of God resting upon your life. Can I tell you, you graduated from certain seasons of your life. Now God is giving you the tools to execute that power that you can make your way to greater. Somebody shout greater. I ain't selling for just understanding the power, but I want to know how to use that power. I want the power to work in my life. I want the power to be evident that I can walk and work in my discernment. I can work in my gifts. I can walk in my authority. I can pray heaven down no matter the condition. I can walk in the atmosphere and change the atmosphere. I can make the young lady or the young man come into alignment to show them that I'm God's king. I'm God's queen. I'm trying to tell you, you've graduated to another level. And now God is giving you the tools that you can see yourself 
differently. I'm going into the room knowing and seeing, God, what it is that you're trying to show me through this relationship. What it is that you're trying to show me through this storm? I'm trying to help you. That even through this sickness, I know it's not unto death, but God's going to get glory out of my life. Somebody say, he's going to get glory out of my life. Even in the midst of death, he's going to walk with me through the valley of the shadow of death. I'm trying to arm you that you're no longer an entry level Christian uh, sipping on milk, but God has expectations of you that you can live and digest the solid food of God that as you enter into this season, I'm getting my life back. Not the life that I lived five years ago, but he has greater for me because greater is he that lives within me than he that's in the world. Everything about your life is about to be different. Everything about your story is going to be elevated. You can't even go to work without walking in your greatness. You're not even going to go to the bank without walking in your greatness. The next date you go on, you go on with greatness knowing what God has for me. Somebody declare as for me and my house, we will. John's gospel is the gospel of acceleration, multiplication, and demonstration. It's a gospel that teaches and preaches and demonstrates, somebody say, miracle signs and wonders. Yeah, John cultivates an atmosphere that has Jesus preparing and prepping you and I for the whole, for the greater. Because the whole gospel of John is a gospel of elevation. Kimberly, it's a gospel of the elevation of the community, an elevation of culture, an elevation of character. Can you say that with me? An elevation of community. It's an elevation elevation of culture and it's the elevation of my character as Jesus comes through this gospel with bold expressions of love that life and the will to live is demonstrated throughout this gospel y'all John sets the stage as he describes Jesus as the light somebody say Jesus is the light he's the true light which brings hope and life to the dark and the despair. Jesus demonstrates that he's life by building up a community of men and women. He shows up on the scene. He speaks a word to Nathaniel and based on what Nathaniel saw, he tells Nathaniel in John 151, you will see greater things than these. And I want to tell you based on the word of God that you hear today. If you can believe God just on his word, he's going to speak a word back to you that He, you shall see greater than this. Oh God. We get to John chapter 2 and he blesses the whole community. There are men and women there. There are families there. Y'all, it's a wedding at Canaan. Everybody's at the wedding. The couple is there. They're ready to get united and it feels so good y'all they ready to be excited but all of a sudden the couple runs out of wine Jesus some kind of way through the pressing of his mother he works a miracle and turn water into wine and John 2 and 12 says that this is the beginning of signs that Jesus did in Canaan of Galilee I want to tell you as your eyes begin to open as your heart begin to shift this is the beginning of an entirely different season for you we are in the ninth month we are in the month of birthing we are in a new season we're about to enter a new quarter now John chapter 2 this turning of wine was simple simply a, a, a turning of joy the, the wine represented joy and when the people ran out of wine.
mind. It symbolized that they had lost their joy. Life had gotten the best of them. Stagnation began to take over. But when Jesus shows up, can I tell you that your joy is going to be restored? That your life is going to be restored? Don't sweat it. Don't argue about it. Don't stay there too long. I'm telling you, Jesus is on your case. And if you're crazy enough to believe me with whatever you're going through, I dare you to open your mouth and give God praise to let you know that Jesus is working on your case. Whatever your issue, Jesus is on it. Whatever concerns you, concerns him. Somebody thank God that I'm in process. Oh God, somebody said they're working on my stuff. My stuff is being made. Why? Because special orders take special time. Look at somebody and say, special orders take special time. Years ago, I remember Dennis, Dennis Proctor telling a story about McDonald's and he had to pull over. I couldn't understand the other day. There wasn't anybody in line about a week and a half ago. I uh, just got a simple, I got a fish sandwich and a fry and, and a drink. Wasn't nobody in line. And I uh, couldn't wonder, wonder why they asked me to pull over. Wasn't nobody in front of me. Wasn't nobody behind me. You know, and I just wanted fish sandwich, add lettuce, and that's it. Nobody in front of me, nobody behind me, but they asked me to pull over. And I, when I pulled over, I, I asked him, I said, well, why did you ask me to pull over? He said, well, sir, uh, special orders take special time. And I wonder, you, you've been frustrated, but I want to tell you that you've been putting in some special orders. And in the midst of your weariness, I want you to know that it takes special time. So, as you're pulling over, know that God is working on your special order because it takes what? Special time. And hallelujah. And then when you get it, you know it's going to be freshly made. You know it's going to be designed just for you. You know it's not a sandwich they didn't have sitting around all day. Somebody thank God that I'm operating in my special order. Oh, thank the, thank the name of Jesus for my special, my special order. Throughout the Gospel of John. Jesus is demonstrating for us in chapter 10 of how he's being the good shepherd. Well, hope you've enjoyed the program today. Again, let us remember and never forget why 911 will never be the same for us as it relates to this country. Thank you for spending this time with us. Before we go, just want to remind you we're excited about the Towson African American Festival will be hosting the gospel stage on this coming Saturday, the 17th. Uh, we also have our cruise uh, that'll be taking place. You can get more information about the cruise as well as the wonderful lineup of artists that'll be joining us. You don't want to miss this year's festival. It's going to be awesome. But to get all the details to make plans to join us on the 17th, both the cruise as well as the festival, go to heaven600.com. That does it for me. Hopefully, uh, if you don't have a place to attend for fellowship this morning, you might consider an invitation to join us at 3600 Edmondson Avenue. If not, we'll look forward to connecting with you tomorrow morning on Heaven 600 and next Sunday right here on Grace and Glory. Until then, continue to walk in His grace and live in His glory, and we'll see you then.
watching WMAR 2 News. Marilyn Mosby's legal team has gotten a small victory ahead of her upcoming trial.